Hey, Nate. Yeah, Sam. What you been up to? Well, you know, just working from home here, trying to do my best to socially distance from people. What about you? About the same. I wonder what's going on with college. I wonder what the dean is up to. I don't know. Hey, I got, I got a, a question, question about, about that. that. Welcome to another episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That. I'm Sam. I'm Nate, and this is a podcast and video series where we talk about all the fascinating research going on here at Penn State Everly College of Science. Today, it's a little bit different. Um, we're not going to talk about research specifically, but we're going to check in with the dean of the Everly College of Science to see what's going on at the college during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, let's check it out. We are joined via Zoom by Doug Kavaner. He's the Vern M. Vern M. Willeman Dean of the Everly College of Science. And we wanted to ask him about what was going on in the college during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic here. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Great, great to be here with you guys. Uh, maybe first of all, you can talk about your experience. Um, how has it been working from home so far? Um, so it's actually been quite uh, fine with me and doing lots of Zoom meetings. Uh, and um, I, you know, I think I'm sort of in a fortunate situation, which not everyone's in, but uh, I, uh, I like to garden. And so uh, it's springtime. And so in five minutes in between Zoom, I can run out and do something quickly if I need to. Uh, my daughter is home uh, from Northwestern and she's taking her, her last uh, quarter of the academic year uh, remotely. So she's around, uh, but she's great fun. And it's terrific to have uh, her here. I, I do feel very sympathetic to, we have lots of our faculty and staff uh, and some of our graduate students who have, who have uh, small children at home. <laughs> and that's much more challenging for them. So I really kind of feel for for those individuals who are trying to, you know, continue to do their work remotely uh, while they're dealing with some very needy kids uh, running around a background. Uh, but for myself, I'm, you know, this is actually, uh, is, is fine. I'm, uh, I'm still very much engaged, uh, uh, working more than ever. There's just, uh, it's everything then plus all of the complications and planning Mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as the Dean of the college, what are some of the things that you can't do now that you're working from home? So for myself, <clears throat> there's really not, uh, much that I can't do, um, in terms of just, you know, performing, uh, my, my normal duties and functions. I can do this all, all remotely. Because much of my job, of course, is, is dealing <clears throat> with, in meetings and uh, responding to emails, and I can do that all uh, remotely. Um, I, you know, there are things that I, you know, very much miss, uh, you know, having that interaction and being on campus and feeling the buzz with the students around. And, of course, this is the time of year, too, where uh, we're in the graduation uh, commencement week, and this is normally a time when we have we have uh, various volunteer boards that are coming back. We have various um, celebrations and recognitions of our students. So I'm I'm missing all of that a lot. But I'm still, you know, your specific question really is: Are there things I'm not able to do uh, that are you know kind of essential? And I'd say no, there isn't. There, but there's a whole bunch of things I wish I could be doing and wish I could be involved in that aren't possible now. Right. Yeah, so as you, as you mentioned, we're recording this sort of a few days before commencement um, for the semester. How did the um, transition to remote classes go for the college? Um, you know, I think it went, uh, you might say surprisingly well, although I, I don't think I was surprised in part because um, a couple of things. One is that our college in particular um, 
had the foresight to get on this pretty early in terms of planning. So we were thinking in in early February that the, the this might happen. So we started talking and started thinking about how we would do this and started making arrangements. So we were probably a good month ahead of virtually any of the other colleges or any of the other universities in the country in terms of planning. Now, the other thing too is that um, we, uh, we have a lot of really good experience with uh, remote instruction, you know, of course, World Campus, which isn't really considered remote instruction, it's really online instruction. Uh, <clears throat> but our faculty are used to uh, doing this, or a large fraction of them. So uh, I think it's been relatively easy. And we've been getting very, uh, well, I would say not very, it's more like relatively high praise from <laughs> students compared to other universities, I would, I would say, is that <clears throat> we're, we're getting you know, positive feedback that things are going really quite well. Now that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of concerns and complaints and issues that pop up. There are lots, uh, but it's uh, it's I would say overall it's gone remarkably well. Uh, you know, it's not the what what we want to be doing <laughs> in the future. Uh, I suspect that we'll be doing some remote instruction in, in the fall. You know, mm -hmm. my. Uh, I'm sure this is probably a question you were thinking about asking, but I can <laughs> yeah. sort of transition into that is that, you know, we're expecting that we'll have students back on campus in the fall. And, uh, and that, of course, um, raises a very large number of, of issues about how do we keep everyone healthy in a situation where there will be a high density of people you know, in the pandemic, the whole, it all boils down to proximity and density. Right now, if you're on campus, it's sort of like your likelihood of contracting the virus is essentially zero because no one's there. But <clears throat> come fall, you know, and we've got 40 plus thousand students and a large number of faculty and staff members, uh, uh, then all of a sudden the density gets to be high and how we're we going to deal with that. We're still in the process of figuring that out. My guess is going to be a kind of a combination. Uh, we probably will not have, uh, you know, several hundred students packed into a, a lecture hall. It probably not, we're going to have to figure out how to do that differently. That doesn't mean that it will all be remote. Uh, it could be, for example, <clears throat> you might have maybe 20% uh, of the students at any one time in a lecture hall, and they're scattered out. And your students may rotate. You may sort of flip the classroom where the students are learning more outside of the classroom, and then you use the classroom time to answer questions and address questions. But you do so in a, in, with a smaller number of, of of people in a, a large room. Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of in general what I, I see is going to happen in the fall, just in terms of, let's say, uh, <clears throat> in, in the classroom. Yeah. It's going to be pretty challenging to figure out how to do this in labs, although generally labs are not as high density just in terms of, of individuals but there's going to be some challenges there to figure out. So, you know, we have a whole team of, of people in the college that are, are working on this. And I would say one of the things too, is that we have a big advantage is that we've been really trying to innovate teaching to instill active learning components and peer to peer teaching. All of those things now we're finding has, is benefiting us in terms of being able to really stay engaged with students remotely. Moving on to, since you, talk, you talked about the challenges of lab courses, but how about research in general? How has the lockdown affected research in the college? 
Yes. So <clears throat> for research, um, with the governor's orders on, I think, uh, went into place in March 24th, then essentially all uh, research stopped on campus except for what was deemed as essential research. Uh, and essential research uh, included things that what might seem obvious, that is people are working on the pandemic or on the, on the virus, but it also included people who were uh, uh, performing research that if they were to stop that research <clears throat> could lead to uh, a substantial loss in data and resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the college, that means that uh, I would say roughly there's around 40 or 50 people who are <clears throat> scattered among 15 buildings or so, something of that uh, magnitude. Okay, so it's a, it's a pretty small number of people uh, scattered over uh, a number of buildings and, and floors uh, <clears throat> that are conducting uh, research now. Uh, and then most people <clears throat> can do a lot of their research remotely, uh, at least for a limited period of time. Um, and even for people who focus you know, largely in laboratory research, um, there's a lot of, of work that needs to be done all the time in terms of data analysis, planning experiments, writing grants, writing uh, manuscripts, uh, having conversations, which can be done remotely, uh, about research. Uh, so that, so the, a lot of people are, of course, are very heavily engaged in, in research, but to a large extent, that's occurring off campus uh, remotely. And you, you mentioned that um, some of the essential research is into COVID. Was, is, has there been since we have a lot of uh, experts in infectious disease in the college, has, has there been a shift of focus towards COVID from other, other areas of research? So yes, and it's occurred in two uh, different areas of research. So one area of research um, is people who are working at the molecular cellular genetic uh, level uh, who are, are now gearing up to do uh, new experiments using the uh, coronavirus. Uh, now, I, I would say, I would hesitate here to say that they're not dealing with SARS-2 directly, uh, except in very limited cases. We have a BSL-3 facility where you would be conducting that research. But there is a family of coronaviruses, uh, and most of those are pretty safe to work with. And they have a lot of the same characteristics. So there's a great value in doing research on coronaviruses. It can be done, done in lower level containment facilities that uh, many of our faculty have. Uh, but then I would say it's sort of a larger area of research that we have faculty in the College of Science conducting involves in epidemiology and <clears throat> modeling in computation statistical analysis of infectious disease. We have an international center uh, for the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics and some real world leaders in that area. And so they're working really 24 seven and, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, they're just uh, producing a, a large body of work and publishing papers in science and nature, you know, on a daily basis practically. So they're very heavily engaged. And then I would say also that um, this is a little bit off from your question, but um, also uh, particularly Matt Ferrari, uh, who's in the Department of Biology and part of the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics is also providing a lot of expertise and advice to the university in terms of uh, giving advice about how to uh, set up systems and policies and public health policies to uh, mitigate the spread of the virus uh, and just also provide, you know, a good education uh, and continual updates on, on the perspectives about 
about the pandemic. Uh, so we have a lot going on in that area right now. How do you think this period where there's been you know, reduced activity on campus will affect faculty and students moving forward? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And it's one that I'm, you know, greatly concerned about. Uh, you know, it's, there's no denying, of course, to a large extent, it's, it's going to have a negative impact. And of course, we want to try to renew, reduce the, what those negative impacts are. And so, you know, we've already taken steps, for example, uh, for students, faculty, uh, ab about progress through, let's say, for promotion and tenure. So, for example, people who are pre-tenure or on the tenure track are going to be there. They can have an extra year uh, <clears throat> on the on the clock until they have to be reviewed for tenure. Uh, <clears throat> they can opt in for that if at their choosing. Uh, we're doing a lot to try to mitigate, you know, uh, negative impacts on our graduate students and undergraduate students in terms of, you know, time to degree. So um, there are quite a few potential, you know, negative impacts and we're, you know, looking at all of them and trying our best to try to mitigate those you know, the financial aspects too of this to, to, uh, to everyone. But, you know, we're particularly concerned <clears throat> uh, about, uh, you know, first of all, about our students and uh, financial aid that they need. And so fortunately, uh, a number of people have stepped up to provide funding. Uh, some of the leadership in the university, including myself, are giving 10% of their salary into funds for emergency funds to help <clears throat> people who have particularly needs that have been uh, worsened by the, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, that's the, all those things are uh, ones that I probably spent a good half of my day on working on and discussing and working with others in the universities to, to uh, really uh, mitigate uh, the, you know, the negative impacts it's having on 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 all of us uh, across the university. But I, you know, I quite now I see them quite manageable. I think that, um, you know, we there's going to be some financial stress. The university, <clears throat> it's going to reduce our budgets. Um, but our I think they're at levels that we'll probably be able to handle and we'll be able to continue to, to do our best to give, you know, great education to our students and to keep, keep our research going at a very high level and having a positive impact on society and the world. Do you see this having any, you know, long-term effects on students academically? So the immediate concerns about uh, for students who are graduating right now is like, can they get a job? Uh, and when businesses and various things are shut down. So that, <clears throat> that's kind of an immediate impact on, on those individuals. There's going to be, of course, there's going to be some opportunities too. And I think that's, that's going to be really important. And I th hopefully we can prepare our students um, to take advantage of new opportunities. Uh, you know, my, uh, in the commencement comments I made, you know, I, I pointed out that our, that students that are, that are trained in the sciences are, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is really trying to develop their critical uh, thinking skills and problem solving skills. More than just teaching them knowledge about science, it's, you know, doing science requires you <clears throat> to critically think, to, to, to derive hypotheses, test them, use data and analyze those data to formulate, you know, solutions. And, and wow, you know, our future is heavily dependent upon people doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, but more specifically, you know, I think they'll, there will be, you know, there'll be new areas. I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot more 
uh, a lot more jobs and research and uh, and businesses and everything is focused on dealing with infectious disease. Now, for the United States, we did, we've not really spent much money, much time, not much interest in infectious disease. This has largely been an issue for for developing countries uh, in in areas where you know typically there's lots of infectious disease. We've not actually had to deal much with infectious to disease over the past hundred years since the Spanish flu over a hundred years ago now. Uh, but now that's changed. So, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to, we're going to see a, a, a huge growth in interest in, in infectious disease. And I think that's also going to cross over <clears throat> into climate change as well. Um, I think this is a bit of a wake-up call, particularly for the United States, um, that there are these large global issues uh, that we are in the midst of and that we can't just sort of pull ourselves in as a country and isolate ourselves, that you know we are going to be impacted uh, by pandemics in the future, we are going to be impacted by climate change, and these are these are global problems, and and we have to uh, be ready and take uh, a leading role. We should be taking a leading role <clears throat> in in dealing with these uh, with these issues. Yeah, along the along those same lines, I see if you pay attention to the news, I guess these days you're probably exposed. They, the American public is exposed to more science than they ever have been before. So what do you think the role of scientists is during this pandemic? Yeah, that's a really, really good point, is that people are now uh, exposed to science. And, you know, before, I think the public could could say, well, we don't really care <laughs> about science. And, you know, there's been sort of an anti-science movement, I would say, over the past 20 years of people just kind of skeptical about science. Um, but now all of a sudden people realize that, uh, you know, politicians don't have answers to uh, these questions about the pandemic. Uh, scientists do. Uh, and so, you know, you see people like Anthony Fauci all of a sudden becoming a really essential focus in the United States. You know, somebody who very few people knew outside of academia. Uh, by the way, he was, uh, he was our College of Science commencement speaker a few years ago. Uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting him, having dinner with him. And... Uh, and he, uh, interestingly, just kind of foretelling in some sense, one of the things he talked about it at length, and I was really kind of pleased to hear this, um, is he talked about his, his work with, with uh, President George Bush on, on AIDS. And, uh, you know, and Tony Fauci has been involved working with a number of presidents over the years. He talked passionately about uh, about that work. Uh, and, uh, you know, now kind of looking back on that, I can really s see, you know, here's, here's someone who is, uh, you know, trained as a hardcore scientist, uh, but has developed over time a, a really good, uh, I would say, he's a great communicator. I would say he's not a great speaker in a technical sense, but he's very effective at communicating and that people have a, a, a sense of trust in what he says. Um, and, uh, he, and I think it's just, it's, it's because he's knowledgeable, but he's thoughtful um, and, um, you know, he's, he's willing to, you know, say things as they are in, in a very honest way. <clears throat> And, you know, that's kind of what I'm hoping that we're training in the college science is that people 
who would not only have that sort of expertise in, in science, but also have, have the ability to communicate and, uh, and therefore in doing so impact public policy for the good. Just, I guess, shifting gears here, are, are there other aspects of the college that are being particularly impacted? Um, like thinking about recruiting or alumni relations, fundraising? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'll just pick, pick one that's, I think there's a lot of interest. You'll, you'll see lots and lots of um, articles and opinions given about what are students going to do? Uh, graduating college, um, graduating high school students, are they going to actually uh, start college or are they going to take a gap year? Are they going to, uh, <clears throat> instead of going away to college in another state, are they going to stay home? And there's lots of uh, things in the news these days about this. That's really quite interesting, uh, you know, just from society. Of course, it's going to potentially impact us uh, in that I, I would say right now, we really don't know how this is going to fall out. Uh, we have, you know, we're doing very well in terms of what we call paid accepts. Paid accepts are those students who we've made offers to, they have accepted our offer and put a deposit. Okay. Now, the reality every year <clears throat> is that a certain fraction of those individuals uh, decide you know, they'll just give up their, their deposit and go elsewhere. We call this the summer melt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so uh, everyone in recruitment and missions is worried about the summer melt and what, <clears throat> what that's going to look like. And, um, you know, it's right now we, it, things look really good because the number of students who have accepted with the posits is quite high. Uh, and uh, so we look like we're in really great shapes uh, for the fall semester. But the question, will those students show up? <clears throat> and what are, what's going on in their minds? Uh, so, you know, you might think about, well, if you're a high school student, you think maybe I'll take a gap year. Okay. This would be a good time. So what, but what do students typically do when they take a gap year? Mm, maybe they'll go to Europe or maybe they'll go somewhere else, right? So all of a sudden it's sort of like, what are you gonna do if you take a gap year, right? If you're gonna stay stuck at home, I think a high school student go like, mm, maybe I'll just go to college anyway, even if it's partly remote. So, you know, it's, I, you know, this is just my conjecture about that particular issue, but there's a lot flying around right now <clears throat> thinking about what, what uh, high school graduating students are going to do. And of course, this has a big impact on the university because our budget is so largely driven by tuition from undergraduate students. And so if there's a big drop in the number of students coming in the fall, this will have a big uh, negative impact on the university budget. Uh, so it has, has all kinds of different consequences how, how this, this plays out. But it's very interesting just to kind of hear, hear high school students talk about this as they're kind of pondering what they're going to do. Uh, I think we're gonna be okay in this, just some, some practical aspects. One is I think public universities, large ones, <clears throat> who largely are, uh, you know, about 50% of our students at University Park are from Pennsylvania, just a slight bit more of that. But then, uh, you know, then a large fraction of out-of-state students are within shouting distance right there from New York and New Jersey. I have a son who's in this uh, situation right now. Ah, he's, yes. <laughs> he's gonna go to a, the College of Agriculture, but we, we're having these conversations mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we're not any closer to an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
but it is a interesting dilemma. And yes, it is. <laughs> um, so Doug, you've announced that you're going to step down as Dean. You're going back to research. So first off, how has this pandemic really, has that changed your timeline at all? Uh, yes, a bit. Um, so <clears throat> the, uh, so the search for the new Dean is, is conducted by the provost's office. And um, so they have sort of slowed down. Uh, they've not stopped. In fact, they're doing, they're doing some Zoom interviews, but <clears throat> they, uh, they'd really like to be able to do the final interviews of the, <clears throat> you know, probably three candidates that they would they would have on campus. They'd like to do those, of course, in person in the fall. Mm -hmm. So they delayed that part. And <clears throat> so I was asked and I agreed to continue on as Dean until the end of the calendar year. Uh, and with this sort of expectation that by then they'll probably have someone in place. So I think that's probably likely how that will go. Uh, there might be someone that would come in a bit sooner than the end of December, but that's, it's going to be somewhere in late fall or by the end of December. You know, I, I have been told that there's a really good slate of, of, of candidates. So I think they're quite pleased with the candidates that they have. Uh, so I'm sort of happy to report some very in, in, informal news in that way. Well, that's great. And um, I think we pretty much covered the what's going on during this is if, was there anything else that you wanted to say i always close every zoom <clears throat> with uh with urging everyone to you know sort of take this opportunity as you're working at home remotely um uh, is whenever this sun is shining and you've got some time go outside <laughs> and enjoy this <clears throat> enjoy the spring particularly here in central Pennsylvania, it's, it's a beautiful spring. And I think it really is beneficial to everyone's mental health to get outside uh, much more than we typically do, you know. So that's kind of the bit of a silver lining actually is that uh, when you're working at home, if you've got a few minutes and sun's out, go out there and enjoy it while you can. Great, we appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks so much for, okay. for doing this and coming on the podcast, Doug. Um, I think it was really informative, so we appreciate it. Okay, great. You guys take care now. So that was cool. Yeah, it was really cool to hear, you know, Doug is working from home just like we are and can still run the college from home. Right. And it was good to hear that even though things aren't perfect, that classes have continued, students are graduating, and research continues. So if you want to learn more about what the college is doing during the COVID-19 pandemic, we will have links in the show notes below. And if you'd like to find out how you could help support Penn State's COVID-19 response, we'll have links to that as well. So thanks for joining us on another episode of Hey, I Got a Question About That. Uh, if you haven't already, please go back and check out our past episodes. You can find us on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Yeah, thanks. Bye. We gotta got put the dog in, in the intro. This is my last one. Sorry, Our haze didn't match up. Yeah. So I ruined it. <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna make that work. That was stupid. That's a special episode. Be like Doug. I don't know what I'm gonna say, but. You know why? But, but that's how we learn. That's right. It didn't feel right the minute it came out of my mouth. It's amazing how many people are my former neighbors. But also, if you would like to learn about. Oh, I keep stumbling on that one. There's too, there's too many words. I have nothing to do with my face at the end or if I should say something. Just say bye. Goodbye.